Good morning and happy Tuesday. I hope everybody had a great weekend and a great Monday. This is Mr. Kennedy. And for today, we're going to talk about ancient India. I always like to start with geography, and this is going to be no different. And I've got a picture here of the Indian subcontinent to give you an idea of, you know, what it looks like. One of the important things I want you to know is that this is a subcontinent. It was once a free-floating continent that is moving north according to plate tectonics, and it has smashed into the Asian continent and become attached kind of like a, um, I don't know, it's just come attached and it's not going anywhere for a while. And because of its forward movement, it has collided with the Asian continent and has pushed up the land where the Asian continent and the Indian continent have met and has created the tallest mountains in the world, the Himalayas. Within the Himalayas, you have the two tallest mountains in the world. You have Mount Everest and you have K2. Within the Himalayas, uh, lots of snowfall and that snowfall melts and it forms the rivers that flow throughout the Indian subcontinent. The biggest of those are the Indus River and the Ganges River. To the south is what's known as the Deccan Plain. This is a volcanic plain that was created. It's fairly flat and it is pretty high above sea level, comparatively speaking, to what you would expect. Now, I know it's called the Indian subcontinent, but it's really important to know that it's not just India. Uh, you have the countries of India, of course, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, a little bit of China. Uh, so there are many, many different countries that make up parts of the Indian subcontinent. It's also isolated. It doesn't cut everybody off, but it's isolated. The mountains on top and the ocean surrounding it on the other sides makes it where you have to really want to get there. So you do get some traders, you do get some pilgrims, you do get some armies, but it's not like you're just walking in there like you would to a store or something like that. The earliest civilization that we know of in ancient India is known as the Harappan civilization. And what's really cool to me is we didn't even know that these people existed when the 1900s began. They were discovered, I believe, in the early 1920s. So a lot of what we know is fairly recent. And somewhere between 3300 and 3000 BC is when they formed and developed. Somewhere 1900 to 2000 BC is when they disappeared. Uh, it is It is something that we're still working on as we speak. Now, because their writing is pretty undeciphered, a lot of what we have theorized is based off of archaeological evidence, anthropology, and historical theory. We're fairly certain it was a city-based culture, uh, and it was fairly large, fairly spread out. Um, their culture was spread out over an area larger than modern-day Pakistan. The two cities that look to be the most important are Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. And it's thought that they were very big. I'm talking like 35 to 40,000 people. Now, the cities that we have uncovered all look pretty similar. Um, they all have houses that are small, square, and windowless. There is a central citadel or courtyard in town. There are religious buildings that all look similar, which means they probably had the same or a similar religion. All these cities have public bathhouses. Uh, there's granaries where their food was stored. And then sewers. These people had running water and they had sewer system as well. Some other things we found. 
uniform art, meaning that they were all culturally similar. Uniform weight measurements. So whatever they used for their weight measurements were consistent throughout the civilization. Similar measurements. So whatever system of measurements they were using, they used them throughout the entire society, meaning that they were connected to each other somehow. And then uniform money. What we're pretty sure was their currency could be found throughout the landscape where they were located. So they were at least trading with each other on similar terms. Now, when you do an archeological dig, you can dig through layers, you can look through time in a way. And what has been discovered is that there's not a lot of change from the beginning of their civilization to the end of their civilization. They were fairly resistant to change. So this means that they probably didn't have many enemies. We also don't find very many weapons, meaning that they were mostly peaceful. We think that they were a theocracy, meaning that their priests either ran the place or were very important. We also think that it's an agricultural society because we have found evidence of them growing wheat, barley, peas, cotton, rice, lentils, several things like that. And we know that they traded with their neighbors. We have found evidence of their trade as far as China, Southeast Asia, like modern day Vietnam. And the stuff they traded included ivory, gems, bronze, precious metals. Now nobody knows what happened to them. We think it was probably related to environmental change. Uh, deforestation led to soil erosion, uh, desertification, a drying out of the land. And that resulted, it looks like, in a decline in agricultural production. And their cities start to decline around 1900, and all evidence of them is gone by about 1500 or so. Now, at almost the same time, and this probably didn't help the Harappan society, there's this Aryan invasion. These people known as the Aryans start to migrate from the north. And they come from an area that would today be like southern Russia, around the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, around 1500 BC. Now, one quick note, if you've heard the word Aryan before, you've probably heard it in terms of World War II, in terms of Nazis or neo-Nazis or something like that. It's important to know that these Aryans are not the same Aryans that the Nazis were talking about. Um, so I just want to make sure that you have that distinction between the two. These Aryans, uh, they're also known as Indo-Iranian. Um, once again, they're from the Caspian area and Black Sea area. They're not a distinct ethnic group, but they are various ethnic groups that are united by a family of languages. The languages that these Aryans spoke are all shared or similar. And in fact, the language of these Aryan people is related to every language that we speak today, whether it's English, Spanish, French, German, anything like that. Uh, they're part of the same language family. Some other things that we know about them, um, they had a shared culture and they had a shared religion. Even though they're not all the same ethnic group, these related ethnic groups all had some similarity. Now, over the next 500 years, from about 1500 BC to 1000 BC, these Aryans are gonna establish their dominance over much of India, particularly in the Northern part. Uh, they settle along the Northern Indus River Valley and then they start to settle communities along the Ganges River around 1000 BC. Now, what do we think we know about these? Um, they are nomadic. Uh, they probably traveled in small bands. They probably moving to find new lands for their cattle to graze. And they left us a set of books called the Vedas. 
And the Vedas give us their culture, their history, and their religion. The Vedas have reserved their rituals. Uh, it tells us about their early belief system. It tells us what their priests did. So the Vedas really give us an inside look at what Aryan culture was like. Now, what we know is they had a class-based society. They, the Aryan people, they put themselves above the people who were already there, the old Harappans probably, but these Harappans are gonna be known as Dravidians by the Aryan people. Dravidian also meant Dasas or dark skin. And the Aryans attempt to ban racial mixing. So Aryans and non-Aryans were not allowed to mix. Uh, however, these Dravidians or old Harappans are still going to contribute some of their own culture to the Aryan society. And this class-based society is known as the caste system, C-A-S-T-E. And at the top, you've got the Brahmins. The Brahmins are the priests. The priests are going to run the Aryan society. Below that, we have the Kshatriya, who are the warriors and the leaders, the, the uh, kings and the fighters, if you will. Below that, we have the Vaisya, who are the merchants, the people who buy and sell things. Below them are the Sudra. The Sudra are the everyday workers. So they are going to be the farmers, the artisans, the laborers, things like that. And then below that, we have this group known as the pariahs or the untouchables. The untouchables or the pariahs, they make up a little less than 10% of the population. And they were originally slaves, we think, and then they became outcasts. And there were some strict rules if you were a pariah. For example, you had to bang two, strict, two sticks together to say that you're coming because people couldn't be associated with you or seen with you. Uh, they could not eat with other castes. They could only eat amongst themselves. They could not be seen with anybody else other than themselves. And they did the dirtiest work. They did the undertaking. They're the ones that touched the, the dead people. They did the tanning of leather because they're the only ones that could touch cows or they could touch dead cows. Uh, the pariahs also did the sewer clean. They were the ones that could get dirty. So the pariahs are at the bottom and then everybody else builds on top of that. The top three castes, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vyasas, that was Aryan only. And the caste system is not based on your Indian the caste system is based on your family. Now these castes are very strict. Each of the classes has their own dharma. Dharma means moral code. So there's a certain way that Brahmins are supposed to live. There's a certain way that Kshatriyas are supposed to live. There's a certain way that Sudras are supposed to live. And each one of those has their own moral code. Now this Dharma, this moral code is going to determine uh, what you can do in life, what your occupation is, uh, who you can and cannot marry. It's even going to determine what type of foods you can and cannot eat. Absolutely no intermarrying, none at all. And if you were not in Aryan, if you were an outsider, you existed completely outside of this caste system as well. Now, what about their religion? I mentioned that the Vedas tell us their history and they're also their holy texts as well. The oldest written Veda was written down around 1400 BC. And there are two important parts to the to the, the Vita. One is called the Rig Vita. The Rig Vita, it's a book of hymns, a book of songs, and there are over 1,000 of them in the book. The longer the hymn, 
the more important the deity or the god. And the Vita is also going to talk about their main god, Indra, who was the god of battle and lightning. And it's going to discuss how Indra helped the Aryans fight against the indigenous people. Another important part of the Vedas is the Upanishad. It's about 200 chapters long, and the Upanishad has what become the basic beliefs of what we know today as Hinduism. Another one of the Vedas is the Mahabharata, which is this epic poem. It's a poem that was memorized and recited by memory. That's over 200,000 lines long. And one portion of the Mahabharata is known as the Bhagavad Gita. And the, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, it's gonna tell the story of Prince Arjuna. Prince Arjuna is gonna be forced to go to battle against family members. And his right-hand man, his main charioteer, is going to tell him that you, you have to go and perform your duty. Even though it's your family you have to face and your family you have to fight, you still have a duty to your people and a duty to your country. Well, it turns out that this charioteer, this general in Prince Arjuna's army, is actually the deity Shiva. Now, these Aryans, they do have a belief in a supreme deity. And what's really unique in some ways is this deity is either a single deity that breaks into different pieces or these different pieces join together like you know power rangers megazord or or voltron or something like that to become one single entity and because of this because you could look at it either way hinduism is a monotheistic and a polytheistic religion at the same time uh, there are many different gods. There's Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, among others, but they're all parts of Purusha, who is the creator of the world. So either Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, Krishna, and all those come together to form Purusha, or Purusha is the single deity whose parts are those different gods. Now, this actually isn't that far-fetched. If you are somebody who is, identifies as a Christian, you've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That could be seen as the same way. You've got one deity who, is, who manifests in multiple parts, or you have three different parts that become one deity. The other interesting thing to me about Hinduism is that time is not linear. They believe in this circular path of life. And each cycle through time is a search for truth, a search for, for um, purification. And the idea is the soul, the Atman, goes through time repeatedly over and over and over again until it reaches the point of moksha, which is the release of the soul from this cycle of reincarnation to go and join with Brahma. And Brahma, of course, is part of Purusha. Now, this cycle of reincarnation has a name as well. It's called samsara. And samsara is the process of reincarnation. And when you are reincarnated, you are measured, you are weighed against your karma and your dharma. Now remember, dharma is the moral code of your caste. Karma is going to be the balance of actions and inactions you take. Now often when we think of karma, we think of you're gonna get what you deserve or what goes around comes around. Uh, we look at karma very much as in you know, action, reaction, punishment sort of thing. But to a Hindu, that's not how they look at it. To a Hindu, every action you take has a good and a bad. Every inaction you take has a good and a bad. 
So that's what's weighed. It's not revenge or anything like that. It's did your action have a good outcome or an out bad outcome? Did your inaction have a good outcome or a bad outcome? And how does that measure against the moral code you're supposed to follow? So when your karma and your dharma are measured, you go through the process of samsara and you either come back in the same cast, a cast up or a cast down until you can reach moksha, the release of your soul or your atman from the cycle. All right, that is all for this video. There will be a second video to look for about ancient China. So I'm going to stop this video here, 22 minutes or so, and I'll get on with the next. Any questions, as always, just email me and I will answer as quick as I can. Talk to you soon.